right, well, we're starting another uh, Plane of Existence uh, study here tonight, Radical Teaching Series in Defense of Biblical Authority. What we're going to look at tonight, I, I've entitled it The Center of the Universe, uh, because I was, I was just thinking about how, you know, this whole thing with the heliocentrism, the, what started with Copernicus, uh, reimagining what Ptolemy and Aristotle and all these guys from ancient Greece had come up with as far as the makeup of the universe and and uh, our world system and you know uh, taking us from a geocentric, which focused the Earth as the center of the universe, uh, to more of a heliocentric where the sun was the center of the universe for a time, uh, the the Earth spinning around the sun. Uh, of course, that produced the ability to. Um, come up with all kinds of ideas that really made the, the need for God uh, unnecessary. And um, in that idea where we're now focusing on the sun being the center, and then, of course, later they said, well, there is no center of the universe. You know, um, as we think about those ideas, you know, it's, it's interesting to me that Satan seems to almost want to do the opposite of what God's word says. You know, a lot of times in, in the Satanism and paganism, they look at what God's word says and then say, okay, let's do the opposite. And oftentimes they really do uh, twist God's word completely upside down and 180 degrees out of what he intended. And uh, of course, you can look at the family structures that God has set up and, and, and so many things, you know, um, the whole idea of evil is a departure from good, and the true good is God himself and his word. And so a departure from that really means to get away from uh, this earth-centered uh, God's promise and God's uh, favor being upon his creation, this creation that he has described in his word, and a, a real focus on, on man's uh, plan, God's plan of redemption for man. All those kind of things seem to be the focus of what God's word is. And the more we get into this heliocentric model, and then, of course, later the Big Bang model that says there is no center of the universe, it really seems to go in, in an opposite direction from what the Bible is teaching. And so I, I thought, you know, if we take that from there is no center of the universe at all and bring that back to God has placed the earth at the center, is there a center of the earth? And with the flat earth model that is, is commonly produced out there, uh, this idea of um, you know, the, the flat surface being a circle, a disk, uh, all the, the continents being around the central pillar of that disk being the North Pole. And then the South Pole, what, what is known as the South Pole, is just really a ring around that disk holding in the waters of the earth. And uh, that's the common model, you know. We don't know if that model is true, obviously. And, and a lot of the things we're going to talk about tonight, you know, there's no way we can prove it. All we can do is examine God's Word. Uh, we have no means of going to the North Pole and, and proving what, you know, what we might think about it to be true uh, in opposition to what we have been told. Uh, obviously, making a, a trek to the North Pole is extremely dangerous and the South Pole as well. And there is no, to, no way to prove those things outright. But uh, we can stand upon God's word and we can uh, examine God's word and try to understand um, what God has said about his creation, what he has said about at the end of his creation when he decides to um, start over again. You know, as we looked at the flood, he he basically decided to start over again, and, and the Bible says that he's going to start over again once, once more as a means of judgment upon the earth for rejecting him. He's going to uh, completely incinerate the entire universe, which is the concept that we find in the book of Revelation and other places. And so um, in thinking about that, is there a center of the earth? Um, well, this model that we talk about really does put the North Pole at that center. And it's very interesting as we look at Copernicus and this, this uh, fundamental change in the way people thought or the, uh, the 15th, 16th, and 17th century 
as they went into that time of renaissance, which became a time of uh, enlightenment where they completely took the Bible and threw it away as far as being a repository of truth. But at that time, the maps that dealt with the North Pole, very interestingly, uh, focused in on that centerpiece of the, the Arctic Circle area uh, being an actual place. Not the frozen wasteland that we know of it today, uh, but an actual place where people dwelled and uh, land masses were located. And it's, it's quite interesting because um, all of the ancient, not all of them, but uh, many of the ancient civilizations and religions and, and philosophies of, uh, you know, many thousands of years ago also believed that that North Pole area was indeed a, a place of paradise. That's where paradise was and paradise was lost. Just as the Bible teaches the Garden of Eden, uh, the paradise story there, the tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, all those things. And then man sinned, broke God's laws and was kicked out of that area and could not return ever to that area. And so as we understand that and, and think about that, we have to at least say, well, is that area now that was once known as the Garden of Eden, is it completely um, gone? Is it uh, not detectable at all by us because of the flood? Is it, has it been destroyed completely? Or is it um, possibly in this North Pole region, as many people are beginning to wonder about? And uh, so that's kind of what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, it gets away from the, the firmament discussion that we've been having. But interestingly enough, you know, we're, we're talking in this section of our study right now, uh, as we've gone through here, you know, we've talked about the suppression of the truth. We've talked about the, the deception itself and, and man's attempt to hide the truth of who God is and, and the truth of his word and really produce a, a theory that says God is dead. Uh, but we are in this section right now of biblical cosmology. And so we're looking at what the Bible says and saying, well, can we find that on the earth today? Can we find what the Bible is saying here and reproduce that somewhere here on the earth in an effort to support the biblical text. Um, because certainly over the, over the course of time, the Garden of Eden has become euphemism for, you know, that's just fairy tale. It was a spiritual thing, a spiritual truth that God was trying to teach. There was no real Adam and Eve. There was no tree. There was no serpent in the tree trying to deceive them. It's all just spiritual stuff as we've talked about in the past already uh you know people take god's word and put it in that category of uh allegory or spiritualization and uh but i want to again look at it from a biblical cosmology perspective and say is there a real place called the garden of eden does that place exist today is it possible to go there and all those kind of things are interesting in the light of this idea of biblical cosmology. Because if there isn't, I think, you know, there at least has to be the question, um, is it all just spiritualized? Because if we can take this, which is another fundamental piece of, of God's whole plan of redemption, if there was no literal Adam and Eve in a literal place called the Garden of Eden, paradise where they sinned because of a serpent and they were kicked out of that garden and never could return then what's this whole thing about jesus christ all about if there's no fall of man if man didn't really fall in the garden literally then why is there need for a redemption and why is there need for jesus christ if if there was no garden of eden to begin with and so I think it is a, a fundamental thing that we need to discuss here in light of this biblical cosmology. Because within that flat earth dome cosmology that we've talked about, um, as you push towards the center of that cosmology, 
The Bible seems to point to the north. It talks about the north a lot. The furthest parts of the north is, is where heaven is described as being. And, uh, and, and so when we think about the north, um, that's the center of this cosmology that we're dealing with. And uh, so if man, fueled by Satan, obviously, uh, inspired by demonic forces, in an effort to further keep people away from the truth of God, if the Garden of Eden and then above that, God's throne in the furthest parts of the north, if that is all true and real, then certainly Satan would want to keep people as far away from that area as possible. And uh, that's kind of the idea that I'm, uh, I haven't fully uh, <laughs> fleshed it out, I guess you might say. It's probably not a good word and not a, not a good descriptor. Uh, I haven't fully thought it out. It's just something I've been uh, toying around with and researching a little bit. Uh, I think we'll probably have to do one or two more studies on it to fully uh, understand what is at stake here. But uh, I, I do find it very interesting, um, some of the things we're going to talk about here tonight. Um, but one of the things I want to start with here tonight is this uh, verse that we often talk about when dealing with spiritual warfare, you know, oh, I'm under attack. Satan's getting me, boy, he's punching me and he's, he's weakening my, my resolve and my faith and all those kind of things. And we often quote this verse in 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Now, let me ask you this. If there is a massive deception to hide the truth of God himself and God's creation and a defense of his word, if there is a deception that big and that is being suppressed to the level that we have discussed here in this, in this uh, biblical cosmology flat earth uh, discussion, is that a stronghold? Is that a stronghold? If, if millions, even really billions of people have rejected God on the basis of the fact that, hey, I don't have to believe in God because, uh, you know, philosophy tells me we don't have to start with a God. We can just reasonably and rationally think things out. And, uh, and, and through the process of them doing that reasonably and rationally, they've come up with this idea of the Big Bang. And then later they came up with the idea of all the la rock strata on the earth, which produced the idea of evolution, which produces the idea that God's dead and I don't need to believe in God. Is that a stronghold? Yes. That was a, that's a stronghold. I mean, that's like the definition of a stronghold to me is that Satan is trying to deceive the world and blind their eyes from the truth of who God is. And so our weapons that we've been given are not carnal. They're not fleshly. We don't fight with our fists. We fight on spiritual grounds uh, because God's weapons that he has given us are mighty for pulling down those strongholds. And that is a stronghold. I know I, I have um, received... You know, nothing hateful, uh, nothing mean. Nobody's been real mean to me about this whole stuff that we're going through, all this stuff that we're going through. Uh, but I have certainly had people question my motives, you know, about uh, why are you teaching this? You know, why is this a big deal? Why are you uh, spending so much time on this? Why are you, you know, da, 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 da. Um, and I would have to say that, look, if all this is true, or even faintly true, we know that evolution's a lie. We know the Big Bang's a lie. Uh, if you want to go down the road of geocentrism being true and heliocentrism is, is a lie, then those are all lies told by Satan to, in, to deceive mankind and, and draw him away from believing in God. If the Bible truly does teach a flat earth and, and the earth is flat, but it's being uh, suppressed for the purpose of hiding the truth of God, that is the biggest stronghold I can imagine. And yet, what do we see in the Christian church? The mass 
amounts of Christians reject this idea completely out of hand. They won't even discuss it. They won't even consider it for a moment. The possibility of a stronghold being so great as to hide the truth of God, possibly the Garden of Eden, uh, the true nature of the reality that we're living in, uh, this deception about outer space and aliens coming and, and life in uh, billions and billions and billions of different uh, forms from other planets and other solar systems and other universes. I mean, the, the deception goes on and on and on. Not based on science, not based on science, but based on ideology. And I would say uh, satanically fueled ideologies that promote those kind of things. Those are strongholds. Those are strongholds because they get a, a stronghold in a person's mind, in a young person's mind especially, a young child. You know, I've often given the illustration about, um, you know, we think of, of really evil people as, you know, some rock and roller, you know, some guy with tats up and down his arms, you know, and long hair and earrings and, you know, all that kind of stuff, riding a Harley listening to Iron Maiden or, you know, Black Sabbath or something. And that's, you know, that's our idea. Oh, that person's evil. You know, that's an evil person. But I submit to you that that little sweet old lady that's down there at the elementary school on Main Street or on, on Elm Street uh, teaching biology class to those little kids, telling them, there is no God. You evolved out of the slime. The Big Bang produced you. No God needed. I say that woman is more evil than that Harley rider, than that rock and roller, whatever. I mean, you know, obviously we don't know what's going on in their personal lives. And, uh, but just the illustration of, you know, somebody who's deceiving a whole generation of children into believing the lies of Satan. That's an evil person, no matter how nice she is, no matter how good and what a good grandmother she is, all those kind of things. She is influencing a whole generation or two. So all these things are strongholds. All of them are strongholds. So, so what does it say about it? Well, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Would you say that these are arguments and high things that exalt themselves against God? Evolution, Big Bang, heliocentrism, you know, uh, uh, globe earth, climate change, all these things. All these things exalt themselves against God and against his word as it is established, as we know it. And so, um, you know, for me, this is a, a motivation for me to continue along this line. And I become more passionate about it than I was, I think, when I started, you know, because I, I just see more and more as I go deeper into it, I see how many places in the Bible that I have personally ignored or glossed over because I don't want to look stupid and I, I don't want to be ashamed in the eyes of the scientific world, the academic world, and, and people that follow that, you know. Um, and even more so, you know, I've always been fairly conservative and, and fairly uh, bold about evolution and creation and those kind of things. Uh, but I think about some of these pastors that all they want to have is a big mega church. You know, they won't touch this stuff with a 10-foot pole. Because, again, they'll say, well, it's not necessary. It's not. It um, doesn't affect salvation. It doesn't affect your salvation. Why should we talk about controversial subjects? But, again, these are high things, strongholds, that are sending millions upon millions of people to hell. They're exalting themselves against the knowledge of God. And our job is to cast them down. Again, if we can fight at abortion and gay rights and all these tertiary issues that are out there but if we fired at the base of that which is evolution no god all these things 
and, and, and focused our attention on pulling down those strongholds that create the need for people to go and sin in those ways and, and uh, live those kind of lifestyles. You know, it just seems counterproductive not to aim at the stronghold itself. And so, uh, you know, that's, I guess, one of my motivations for doing this. As we talked about last time, you know, does a, a subject that we're going to deal with in biblical cosmology, does it go along with the whole story of God's revelation to us? Does it play into that story, the plan of redemption, or is it a tertiary issue that, you know, well, the Garden of Eden's only mentioned once in the early part of scripture. Why focus on that? Why talk about that? Why is that a big deal? Who cares? You know, it's just a fairy tale or it's, it's just a poetic language or it's, it's the spiritual story of the fall. It, it doesn't go any deeper than that. We don't have to worry about it from that point. But again, this does follow along with the whole biblical narrative. It's a main part of this biblical narrative that man once lived in a place of paradise where God himself would come down in the presence of these people and walk with them and presumably talk with them through the garden in communion with God on a daily basis. And sin came in through the deception of Satan and destroyed that. And man fell and was kicked out of that place of paradise and hasn't been able to return. 6,000 plus years later, here we are talking about all the crazy things that are happening in our world because of man's sin. And so it does very much play into not necessarily the location, but what is the Bible saying? The biblical narrative, the um, biblical cosmology is coming into play once again here in chapter 2 of the book of Genesis. And it says there, I won't have you read your own Bibles, we'll just uh, go on the screen here. Uh, and the Lord formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man who, had, who he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord made every, good, every uh, tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so just right there, we find the creation of man. You know, kind of the second telling of that in the first part, it, it just said, you know, in chapter one, it just said, and then he created man, and that was about it. It didn't go into great detail. But here we have God creating man and putting him in a garden, putting him in a garden uh, where these great trees were growing. And in the midst of that garden, we have a tree of life and a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so these are not... In my mind, in my estimation, these are not poetic stories that we're just meant to allegorize. In my mind, God did this. I mean, that's what the Bible's saying right here. It's not giving you any room, I don't think, to say, well, that didn't really happen. That was just a story that was told, that kept getting told over and over and over again. And there probably was no real Adam and Eve. No, that's, that's not what it's saying here, is it? It's really describing uh, a historical event that is taking place. But most of the world and, and most of Christianity has relegated it to that category of it's just an old story uh, that, that is meant to give us a spiritual meaning. Now, the spiritual meaning is, is foundational. And most Christians, I think, hold to that idea still that man has fallen, that the world as a result has fallen, and uh, that we need redemption. And that's why Jesus came and he died on the cross and he rose again for uh, the forgiveness of our sins if we believe in that. Uh, but again, I think a literal interpretation of this passage right here is this really happened. This is a real place and uh, a real 
historical event that took place in it. And the tree of life is a real tree. Do you believe that? The tree of life is a real tree? And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a real tree as well? And there was a real serpent that was slithering around in that tree who uh, somehow, some way, we don't know, uh, was uh, a manifestation of Satan himself coming to deceive and call into question, by the way, the veracity of the word of God. That kind of plays into the story, doesn't it? (laughs) Calling into question the veracity of God's word. Oh, did God really say, you know, it's always this ever-present deception and lie that we see coming from Satan. And so I think Taking this at face value, we have to believe that these are real events taking place in a real place. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first, Pison, Pishon, however you want to say that, it is the one which skirts the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Now, many people have been interested in finding the Garden of Eden and the land of Havilah just because of that statement right there. Uh, You know, the oil that we find in the Middle East that has made the Middle Eastern so wealthy, some of them, the sheiks anyway, uh, it was found as a result of somebody looking in the Bible at a place where it said that, uh, what, it was talked about tar or something. I can't remember the, the word that was used, but um, somebody read that in the Bible and said, that's oil, <laughs> and went over and found oil, and uh, there you go. That's why we have the petroleum industry that we have. It's because somebody read the Bible, believed what it said about a passage just like the one we're looking at right here, and gold of that land was good, and said, I'm going to go over there and find that gold, black gold, Texas tea. Anybody get that? Two, okay. Two of the older folks here got that? All right. But anyway, many people have been interested in finding it, and they have researched and looked for it for that very reason right there, is to find the gold. And then you see uh, Delium and the Onyx Stone are there as well. Uh, we know kind of after this point, it it starts going into the story of the fall of man, uh, Adam and Eve sinning, and the whole thing with Satan. And and then when you pick up in chapter 3, verse 22, uh, you have man getting kicked out of the garden. And so it says there, behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil, because he took part of that tree of good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And so he placed cherubim. Now, um, it's not just one. There's one sword, but there has to be at least more than one cherubim uh, because he's saying he placed a couple of those angels there to guard that way. And a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Now, is that spiritual? Is that something that can be seen? You know, I mean... Uh, there's just no way of knowing for sure. Uh, but we know that man has not found the Garden of Eden since then. So that may be a, a, a sense of God just saying, I'm protecting it so that man will never find it again and can never enter into the Garden of Eden, have access to that tree of life um, ever again. And so that's an a interesting aspect of the study. Now, As I was kind of commenting before we got started tonight, when we started going down the path of biblical cosmology and studying um, what the Bible says about the creation, what the Bible says about the flood, and what the Bible says about all this stuff, 
you know, we really, I, I've just been amazed at the, the conjunction that we find with our faith, the Judeo-Christian faith revealed to us in the Bible, and the fact that all of these other religions and cultures of the world have similar stories. And, and I've talked about it quite a bit as we've gone through, just saying, you know, that it, to me, it doesn't affect my faith whatsoever. It doesn't make, because, you know, many people will say, obviously, well, look, you know, that just shows you that the Bible's just, an, or the, the Christian faith is just another religion, like all these other religions you guys borrow from each other and, and share stories and make up stories and, and, you know, change the names just to make it fit your, your religion. And obviously that goes on out there. But to me, it points to the fact that these events were true at one time. And when uh, Noah got off the ark with his family and started going forth and multiplying upon the earth, they took these stories with them about the creation, about the flood, about the Garden of Eden, all these stories that they had that had been revealed to them by their descendants or their ancestors, excuse me, and now they're giving them to their descendants. And these stories are making their way out all over, I almost said the globe, all over the world. <laughs> it's so hard when you get those things just in your head. But, um, and, and so to me, it doesn't bother me at all to see this. It, it just points to the fact that it was true. God revealed it. And those stories eventually got out. And then they were changed. As people had different languages, they would name Noah a, a different name than the biblical Noah. And the stories got perverted and they got changed over time and all those kind of things. But the fact that over 270 flood legends exist worldwide has to tell you something about the veracity of the fact that it happened to me and and to many people it, it does and we we looked at this quote one of the strongest evidences for global flood which annihilated all people on earth except for noah and his family has been the ubiquitous presence of flood legends in the folklore of people groups from around the world and so there you have noah's flood but we also as we started talking about this geocentric flat earth firmament cosmology we also found the same thing exactly about that idea of cosmology is that so many uh, cultures and religions and philosophies around the world embraced that cosmology as well, although twisted and you know changed and names and and uh, distinctions are, are changed, but it's all still there. But we, we find with the Garden of Eden or the Tree of Life mythology, the Paradise mythology, is it the same thing? All of the cultures around the world, many of the cultures around the world, have these same ideas about a paradise that has been lost. That man once lived in a place where he had a divine communication with our creator or some kind of divine being and uh, that place was a place of paradise and there were trees in that paradise and in the middle of that paradise there was one big tree called the tree of life and around the world i used to go uh when i was over in the middle east in bahrain we used to go to uh, uh out in the middle of the desert there's this massive tree <laughs> that just came out of nowhere it's like where'd this thing come from and it was called the tree of life over there in bahrain I mean, not a tree around for miles. Bahrain itself is, is just this little sandy island, really. I mean, they planted palm trees there, and there are a lot of palm trees now because they planted them. But, but really, it's a desolate place other than that. And out in this in the middle of this desert, there's this massive tree of life, they call it. And uh, we used to go out there all the time and try to burn it down. But um, it is... Uh, ubiquitous as the flood stories are it, you just find them in cultures around the world uh norse mythology and i think i have a statement about that the tree of life is a fundamental uh widespread myth theme or archetype 
In many of the world's mythologies, religious and philosophical traditions, it is closely related to the concept of the sacred tree and the tree of knowledge connecting to heaven and the underworld and the tree of life connecting all forms of creation, both forms of the world tree or cosmic tree, some, some people call it. Uh, so you have all these places, Mesopotamia, Iran, Baha'i religion, uh, Buddhism, Chinese mythology, Ju Judeo-Christian, obviously what we're talking about tonight, uh, paganism, North mythology, Hinduism, and we can add to that New Age mysticism because let me tell you, if you're going to research this on your own, be careful. I mean, the New Agers and, uh, you know, hug Mother Earth types have picked up on this. And they, they are talking about it a lot. And so you got to be real careful. But it is, um, I think, you know, for us as Christians, you know, this is at the earliest pages of our scripture. This incredible scene, uh, a paradise with God, a big tree, tree of life, tree of knowledge of good and evil, kicked out, lost paradise, you know, and all these things. Four rivers flowing out of it. Uh, it's fundamental in all of these religious uh, traditions around the world. And so um, you can't just toss it out. We can't just say, well, that's just, you know, biblical mysticism or whatever. Uh, we have to wade through the new agey weird stuff. As I was listening to a guy today at lunch, you know, he's going on about this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's talking about all these maps and everything that they found back in the 1500s and, and how they present this totally different picture of what the North Pole looks like than what we have today. And, uh, and then he just goes off the rails on, you know, hug Mother Gaia, you know, <laughs> mushrooms creating the aurora borealis <laughs> all this kind of weird stuff it's like oh never mind so be careful be careful be careful please uh but um i think we can find nuggets of of real biblical cosmology truth here that uh we need to mine and uh, that's kind of what i wanted to do a little bit tonight with it because again i, I don't know if i fully explained this i got off on a weird track but um, you know, right around the time of Copernicus, all the maps were pointing to that place up in the North Pole area as being the, that paradise uh, place at the center, you know, and, and all those things. And then after that, all the maps were rewritten to where it's just a frozen wasteland. You can't go there, <laughs> you know. Now, if it's true that that's where the Garden of Eden is and it is locked into ice and uh, there is a significance there, obviously there's a significance. You know, my, uh, my father-in-law gave me a gift just recently. He gave me a brass compass. You know, and I've, I'd never owned my own, you know, kind of compass before other than my military compasses. And... Uh, you know, I was just walking around the house with it and just checking it out. And it's just fascinating to me. Here we're talking about this stuff. We're talking about the north. We're talking about a place of paradise maybe that's at the North Pole. You know, the Bible seems to indicate that there's a significance about the north. And we have these compasses that point always to the north. And it's just fascinating to me. Um, you know, some of the um, anecdotal kind of evidence like that, really, it, it's just fascinating once you start digging into it. And again, be careful. Um, but, you know, typically what people have said is that Eden, the Garden of Eden, was located at the top of the Persian Gulf uh, in an area where now it's flooded over by the Persian Gulf. And I had another map that said that the Persian Gulf didn't get to the level of depth that it is now until about 4,000 years ago. And so they believe that the Garden of Eden is now covered over by the waters of the, the Persian Gulf. And, and traditionally, that is where the, the Garden of Eden has been thought to be um, because you have these rivers named the Euphrates 
and the Tigris that are in that area. But again, there is no biblical reason for us to believe that this has to be the area where the Garden of Eden is. Again, because uh, all the topography after the flood is completely different than it was. Uh, I mean, we're talking Garden of Eden, we're talking at least at a minimum of 2,000 years before Abraham. 2,000 years before Abraham. And then we have, um, you know, it, it's just a, it's a long, long, long time ago. Uh, and you see uh, a lot of people talking about it as being, that's probably where it's at. But uh, ICR, Institute for Creation Research, had a great quote here. They said, today the Tigris-Euphrates River Valley contains sediments over two miles thick from which are dumped enormous qualities or quantities of oil and gas. The sediments now rock are dramatically bent into modern mountains as well as subsurface mountains and brutally broken by major fault systems. They deeply cover and obscure any possible pre-flood locations. Furthermore, the basement rock, if indeed it was present before the flood, would have likely undergone erosion also. No present topography or underground surface could possibly bear any resemblance to the pre-flood world. That world is gone. And so, you know, I think there is this traditional thing of, well, it's got to be close to Israel, you know. Um, but really, we don't have to believe that uh, because of what's being said right here. And, and the Bible doesn't really point to that either, other than to say some of the things that we've mentioned tonight. It's eastward, but eastward of what? And, and how does that all work, you know, with the... Uh, the tectonic plates moving, as we talked about two weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, where after the Tower of Babel incident, it seems like there were massive earthquakes. Uh, there was a guy named Peleg. He was born at that time, and, and the word Peleg, his name means earthquake, which is amazing. And at that time, the earth was divided. And from that time, we know that people started going in different directions because they spoke different languages and inhabiting other places around the world. And so, you know, it, it's again, we can't uh, say for sure, for definite. Uh, there are indicators pointing in, in some directions that we can kind of reference. But I think what's being said here, hey, that world is gone. Any descriptions of anything back pre-flood, and that's when the scriptures that we just read, that's when they were written. They weren't written by Moses. Moses just kind of compiled everything together and produced uh, the Old Testament scriptures that we have now. But those things were inspired and those stories happened thousands of years ago. And, uh, and, and so any sense of topography is being described as, is completely wiped out. And so... Um, Another thing that's interesting in conjunction, and it's so interesting to me that the creation and the end of the world are, are so closely linked together as we looked at with the flood a couple of weeks ago. But here we find in Revelation 7, after these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea or on any tree and then a little bit later in chapter 9 of Revelation the sixth angel sounded and I heard a voice of the four horns of the golden altar which is before God saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates and so we looked at four uh, cherubim were placed there with that burning sword uh, we didn't see how many were there but here we see release the four angels or the four cherubim presumably uh, who are bound at that great river euphrates so the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind and so they're involved in the end times scenario as well and so we can't read any more into that other than uh, it does seem that these angels were placed to guard the Garden of Eden, to keep man out 
uh, from getting into that tree of life. And then they are used at the very end to uh, carry out God's judgment. And then after that, we have God's kingdom coming down in a new heavens and a new earth uh, configuration that is paradise, is a return of the Garden of Eden, in a sense, uh, but a better one. But I'll just leave you with this, you know, and just looking into this, this guy, uh, William Warren, Dr. William Warren, he was the president of Boston University back in 1885, and he wrote this book, Paradise Found, the Cradle of Human Race, of the Human Race at the North Pole, the Study of Prehistoric World. He goes, it's like a 500-page book that he wrote about what was happening at the North Pole scientifically and um, a lot of people at that time were going against the common notion that it's, oh, it's just a frozen wasteland. And um, there's a guy named uh, Mercator who, who has this map that I wanted to look into a little bit, and we'll look at that later as well. But um, he wrote a letter. He went there on several occasions to the North Pole, and he describes this completely different landscape he describes these four rivers and these four you know this big mountain at the middle of that place and uh, this guy gets into that and he talks about that references that and um, it's pretty interesting stuff you know again can you take it for (laughs) I don't know is it true One, one of the things that I scratch my head about in thinking about this, and we'll talk about that guy's book. I haven't had a chance to read it and really look into it, so I'll hold off on that. But, you know, when I grew up, I saw maps like this, right? At the North Pole, you see these land masses, and then you see this big sheet of ice. And at that time, I don't think they believed that, or, you know, 100 years ago, let's say, that it was just ice, that um, there was a landmass underneath it uh, and the ice was just piling on top of it and then spreading out from there. But you saw maps just like this. And uh, the older maps, you know, again, you go back to the 15, 1600s. Um, obviously, the maps are, are not <laughs> um, completely uh, to scale, let's say. But... Um, you find land masses at the northern points. I don't know if you can see kind of these uh, northern points up here. You see these islands and uh, four rivers splitting these islands and a big rock in the middle of those islands. And uh, Mercator writes this big long letter to the guy who supported him and goes into great detail about, yes, and then we sailed here and we went this way and and we found this, all these rivers, and the rivers are flowing into the center. And uh, at that time, they were sailing ships. And he said, uh, you could not generate enough wind to get a ship out of there. And, and many, um, I think he said like 4,000 sailors sailed into that area and were never able to return because the, the stream is uh, flowing so fast that they couldn't get up enough wind to get out. Um, interesting stuff, you know, is it mythology? Is it, uh, you know, middle ages, dark ages, weird stuff? You know, it's possible. But again, it's right around this time where we looked at Copernicus come up up with his theory and, uh, changing everything. And then all the maps after that, no, it's just a frozen wasteland. There's nothing up there. And today, if you look at Google Earth, and you go to the North Pole, that's what you see. There is no ice even. And what I started thinking about is, I think is interesting as well, is is this whole climate change thing a ruse to hide what's going on at the North Pole? I don't know. There, There is a lot of mystery. And I, again, I call it, you know, kind of anecdotal. You know, there's nothing we can put a stake in and say, this is it. This is the, the nail in the coffin. Um,
Throughout the 14th and 15th centuries, the North Polar Arctic was imagined not as an uninhabitable sheet of ice as modern-day scientists and cartographers hold, but as a series of circular islands. The number of islands vary among these maps, although striking similarities can be seen, even on maps that were made thousands of miles away from one another. Did the map makers of the time simply copy and make additions to the popular maps which were false? Or perhaps, as I'm proposing, that this series of Arctic lands is not made up, but exists on our Earth. This region was subsequently deleted from future maps, and ever since, the common narrative is that the North Pole is a lifeless, uninhabitable stretch of ice. This is a short presentation on these maps, what they tell us, and how they relate. This map from 1531, made by Oronce Fine, shows four large islands at the North Pole, with various landforms scattered around. Just to demonstrate where we are, many have never looked at older maps. This is Europe, Africa, Canada, and Russia. This is Greenland, quite close to the North Pole's southern continent. At the center we see a massive rock formation or mountain. We can draw similarities to the center of the four-continent system of Asian cosmology, where a sacred mountain known as Mount Maru or Mount Shumasin lay. This map from 1534, made by the same mapmaker, gives us a similar but slightly different configuration. The North Polar lands are seen as five or six large islands, and the center being what appears to be a central island, again with a large rock formation. This is Greenland, Scandinavia, Iceland, and Canada. This map is from 1594 and made by Cornelius de Jose. At first glance, we notice how magnified the North Polar region is compared to the previous maps. Instead of Oronce Fine's version with large bodies of water separating the island, we have the four continent system divided by thin canals, which meet at the center where there is again seemingly a massive rock. For reference we have Greenland, Scandinavia, Iceland, and Canada. This map, also from 1594, by Petrus Plancius, shows these same four continents, but separated via hemisphere. The inland sea where the four rivers meet is very pronounced, and again, we can marvel at how large of a system this is and also how close it is to what we would call these outer lands. This map from 1595 by Gerhard Mercator gives us a close-up of this system. In small letters reads, Rupes Nigra et Altissima, the black and very high rock, at the center. There is a mountain range surrounding each island continent, which in one of Mercator's letters he describes as being 14 miles wide. This is a version from 1608. It's interesting that in previous versions of this map, the southern continent isn't sort of blurred out, but is extended. The smaller islands below are completely different. It's hard to tell, but Greenland is practically touching this island with a land bridge, or it could be a thin canal, no more than 5 to 10 miles wide. This undated map of the Arctic Circle, or Circulus Arcticus, is very similar to Mercator's maps around the same time, except the center land contains no magnetic rock or rivers dividing it. It's simply one continent. The word Hyperbore, which labels this continent, refers to the mythological far northern Greek paradise of Hyperborea, the land beyond the north wind. Greenland is referred to in this map as Iloxoa. To the right is Scythia, which is interesting because in the 4th century BC, Aristotle wrote of Hyperborea as being past the Riphian mountains on the borders of Scythia, although no topography is shown on this map. This is an undated Japanese map with no name attached. It looks like it's probably from the mid-1500s. The Arctic region on both hemispheres show it looks like the edges of the four landmasses. This map, too, is undated with no recorded name. It's a Chinese map. We clearly see the northern half of the same structure shown in Mercator maps, 
the indrawing seas, dividing rivers, large rock at the center. Here's another undated Chinese map. This one is the sloppiest, least concise, and most different of all of these maps. There are five or six main islands with various scattered smaller ones. And just for reference, this is Canada, Russia, and this landmass appears to be Greenland. This map from 1567 by Abraham Ortelius includes at the North Pole two of the four island continent system. And this is like the original Mercator maps, showing Greenland with either a connecting land bridge or a thin canal between the borders.